The world needs more women in tech. Good morning or good afternoon. A very warm welcome to Tech Her 2021, an event designed to inspire women in tech. Let's start with good news. You are either studying or working in science, technology, engineering, math, that's what we call STEM, and those are skills expected to be in high demand in the future decades. So congratulations, you have chosen a path full of promises. The not so good news is that the gender gap still persist across the globe. On average, globally, we know that less than 30% of the people fulfilling the STEM occupations are women. And the problem when we push women out of STEM careers is that it drastically impacts the products and services that will shape tomorrow's society. Artificial intelligence, just to give you one example. Women and girls make up half of the world's population and therefore half of its potential. So clearly, we are missing out. Gender equality is not just a fundamental human right, it's also the foundation for a prosperous and sustainable world. We at Volvo Group, we see that we have a responsibility to create a more inclusive workplace and society. So that's why today we're very pleased to hopefully bring a boost of empowerment to you uh, through our speakers, their stories, their insights, their testimonials. And today we have a PhD researcher a Harvard student who dreams to travel to Mars, an ex HR expert, and role models uh, from some of the world-leading tech companies. And of course, we want to involve you in the dialogue, right, Anna? Absolutely. We are going to spend 90 minutes together, and we really want this event to be as interactive as possible. So we are here live with you from Gothenburg, Sweden, and that means that you can join the discussion too. So have your phone close by, get ready to fire away your questions, and on my cue, let us hear from you through Menti. Let's get cracking, Anna. Um, I would like to leave the opening word to Volvo Group CEO, Martin Lundstedt, who is very passionate about leaving society in a much better shape to the next generation. And gender equality is obviously a critical part of that. Let's hear him. So hello everyone. My name is Martin Lundstedt and I'm very proud that the Volvo Group is hosting this uh, Take Her 2021 event today. So most welcome to all of you. And also a big thank you to the uh, great lineup of speakers that we have with us today. So first and foremost, I would like to start with some basic facts. There are an absolute majority of men in most of the technology and tech industries. And we simply need to attract more ladies because we know that working together, men and women, will make the outcome better. Both when it comes to performance, but also when it comes to transforming our industry for the future. It is simply a lost opportunity that we can change into a great opportunity of winning teams. What we see in our industry are two things. First and foremost, that transportation infrastructure will continue to increase across the globe, but it needs to be more sustainable. That's why we have a deep and firm commitment to deliver Paris. 2040, all our products and services will be fossil free and it will be a steep acceleration already starting now. That requires a combination of people and teams that understand both new business models combined with new technologies, such as electromobility, autonomous solutions, connected and digital services. And that's really cool. And here we need the full-fledged diversity into our teams. So, what can we do together then? First and foremost, an event like this, to get inspiration together about how things are working, to interact and to show that you are actually um, uh, into an industry with a lot of great opportunities. I think you should be congratulated to have chosen a field of profession that will be super interesting for the future where you can make a great impact. 
We in the group, we are firmly committed that continue to work towards diversity in all shapes and forms. Of course, gender, but also other very important aspects of sexuality, of geography, culture, age, because diverse teams will make us win. So again, thank you for participating and hope to see you in the future. Take care. So the world is missing out when men, women, non-binary people are not working together side by side. But what is actually stopping women and girls to enter tech jobs or studies in the first place? And what is it that we can do to reverse the trend? This is what our next speaker uh, will guide us through. This is Erika Sultan, who is a PhD researcher at uh, Linköping University. This is in Sweden. Uh, very warm welcome, Erika. You. you have uh, studied the topic for five years, so obviously we're not going to go through all your, your research, but perhaps we can get a, a taste of it. And I would like to start with this first question. How many women really are actually in tech across the globe? Mm. Thank you, Celine, and thank you also for this invite. I just want you to rest your eyes a little bit here first. This is the gender gap in emerging jobs, and we can see that in content production and in people and culture, women are well represented. But if we turn our eyes here, we can see that in data and AI, engineering and cloud computing, the representation of women are actually lower. And one can think, there's a lot of women here. But I also want you to, re to remember that if there are lesser than 30% women, the voices of the women are not heard in these fields. I want you also to know a little bit about your future colleagues. This is the global enrollment of women in STEM fields, science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. So this is a global enrollment, as I said, and this is the future, and it's not looking good. We have um, between 3 and 8% enrollment of women globally. But this is also not the whole truth, because I also want to show you this. This is the statistics from the employment and industry by gender of Asia and the Pacific. And look here, <laughs> Cambodia, 50% women working in the tech industry. And Tonga, over 70% women working in the tech industry. What does this mean? It means two things. Clearly, this is a cultural phenomenon of women lacking in the tech industry. And also, most importantly, things can be different. Given women equal opportunities to pursue and thrive in tech ensures a diverse and talented workforce. Yes, absolutely. And it prevents biases in products and in services, just as Celine talked about in the intro. And I just want to take you into some few examples what happens when women are left out or not in the field. We can take cars as an example. Cars are made for men by men. That means if you are a woman in the driver's seat or in the passenger seat, you are actually in the risk of getting hurt, more hurt than a man, if you are in an accident, because the car is not built for you. We can also talk a little bit about work gear. Work gear is very interesting. Uh, protective gear that you need to use for your work. It could be things like uh, protected eyewear, gloves, clothing. That is also made for men, by men. And that means even though you are using your protective work gear, it's not going to protect you as much as it would a man. Uh, do you maybe use virtual headsets for research or innovation, or maybe just for fun? And if you are a woman now listening, maybe you also get a little bit sick when using it. Maybe a little bit hint of emotion sickness. And let me tell you, the default setting of a virtual headset is actually made for a man, because man's pupils are also a little bit further apart than a woman's. And by having this default setting, it also means that you, when using it, are also in a <laughs> bigger risk of getting that motion sickness. 
and smartphones. <laughs> if you are a woman now listening, or a man listening, working with smartphones, can you please just make them a little bit smaller? Because as they are right now, they actually don't fit in the average woman's hands. So that's an issue. So we are losing out. We are losing out when women are not represented in tech. But how come girls don't become women in tech? The sad story is that girls seem to lose their interest in technology when they are around 11 years old. My own and others' research point to that girls are actually interested in technology when they are younger, but they lose their interest as they get older. And this losing of this interest depends on and is caused by challenges that girls are met with as they grow older. And these challenges, these obstacles could be um, uh, gender stereotypes. Uh, tech is often seen as masculine. And we start to underestimate this girl's abilities and tech early, early as in preschool. Early as in preschool, we start to think that girls are not able to solve technical problems or they are just not interested. So we buy these presents for them. They are very clearly not tech presents for Christmas or birthdays. It's also a male-dominated culture. A male-dominated culture. Hey, you, man listening right now, if you are working in a male-dominated uh, culture, that means you have to create a culture that is more welcoming for women or for girls to become women in technology. Girls are also have lesser female role models. They see lesser women working within tech. Could be in the media, books, film, movies, and also if you are a girl from a minority, there are even fewer role models for you. So we have to step our game up here. The question is, what can you do? Research is doing one thing, your work is doing one thing, but what can you do? Well, if you tomorrow morning step out of your flat, your apartment, your house, and your bicycle has a flat tire, then fix it. Don't immediately just give that flat tire away to someone else. Try to fix it yourself. Do you have a computer problem? Don't give that problem away to someone else. Try to fix it. Try to fix it first, and then give it away if you can't fix it. And why am I saying this? I'm saying this because a girl is watching you. A girl is watching and observing you, how it is to be a woman in a technical world. Because by believing in yourself, you are believing in them. And therefore also invited them to a technical world. And I just want to leave you with this quote. And almost every successful person begins with two beliefs. The future can be better than the present, and I have the power to make it so. Thank you. Thank you very much, Erika, for setting the scene for us. And even on small things now, we're taking a way that we can act as role models. Now, if you are where you are today, it might be because you once had a dream, a dream to understand how things work, uh, to design things, to invent things, to make things. Uh, our next speaker has a big dream. But before I introduce you to her, uh, we would like to get to know you a bit, right, Anna? Yes, tell us something about you. Let's bring out our phones and we would like to hear about your dreams. So use this Menti code and type in what your dream job or dream project is in tech. So use the Menti code, type in with a couple of words and while we are waiting for your answers, Celine, I'm curious about your dream project. Uh, my dream project? Yes. <laughs> um, do, do you know, actually, w one of my dream projects might be what we're doing today, 
Uh, I'm really quite fond of women. I think they're very strong. And for me, giving them a voice is very meaningful. Mm. And uh, by using a digital platform like today, it allows us to, to reach thousands. Uh, I think we're over 5,000 watching uh, right now. So it's quite a community. It is, mm. yeah, absolutely. Uh, so let's see if we can get some of the dream jobs up here. OK, we have designers was being a pilot, now is an engineer. Oh, well, that's a really cool. Green energy enabler. Uh, save the environment, yes, absolutely. I echo on that one. Truck test driver, very cool. In a moment, we will meet a, a UX uh, designer specialist and also someone working with machine learning. So uh, they're part of our panel. So mm. perhaps we can pop the question, how did yeah. they make it there? Absolutely, absolutely. <laughs> now, our, uh, our next speaker has a big dream, and she even wrote a book about it. Uh, she dreams of traveling to Mars and be the first person, the first human being on Mars. Her name is Abigail Harrison, or Astronaut Abby. Uh, she first started to talk about her dream when she was only 13, and she became a, a space uh, exploration champion uh, to her uh, social media followers. They've now exceeded over 1 million. At the age of 18 only, she created uh, a non-profit organization called the Mars Generation, aiming at educating kids and young adults about tech and space exploration. She's really a rising star in her field. She has a degree in biology. She's also intern at a NASA-funded astrobiology lab, and she's been featured in some of the world's uh, most renowned magazines, I mean, Times and Forbes and USA Today and BBC, etc. Abby, it's such a pleasure to have you with us today. Thank you so much for, for joining live from your uh, apartment in Boston. Um, can you hear us, Abby? Yes, I can hear you. Oh, Thank you so brilliant. much for having me today. In a moment, we're going to read, we're going to hear about your extraordinary journey, and we want to make this an interactive discussion, right, Anna? Absolutely. Uh, so. Why not take this pretty unique opportunity to have a chat with a future astronaut? So what is your question to Abby? Post this via Menti and we will get back to you for a Q&A session after Abby's speech. So Abby, you are dreaming of exploring space. How did it all start for you? So for me, my dream really started at a very young age. Uh, like all other children, I asked a lot of questions. I asked why, how, when, and then again, like many children, I continued to ask why, 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 constantly. However, my curiosity wasn't bounded to Earth. I played with gravity here on Earth, falling off of swing sets and such as kids do, but my entire life I was also dreaming of flight. One of my earliest and most pivotal memories is from when I was about four years old. And I remember staring up at the night sky and being filled with a sense of awe about how much existed to explore. And I had all of these questions running through my head, but I only knew one answer. And the one answer that I knew for sure was that I was going to be a part of finding the solutions to the universe's mysteries. I wanted to go to space to become an astronaut. For me, that was the start of a dream that has lasted a lifetime. From that moment on, I've worked towards this dream with unending commitment. However, of course, my 20 years since discovering my dream haven't all been explicitly focused on this achievement. First, I had to learn how to <laughs> read and write as most four-year-olds do. <laughs> Uh, my journey towards my out of this world dream really took off when I was about 11 years old, when I gained my first supporter and advocate. And like many, my first uh, supporter, the first person other than myself who believed in my really big, and if you'll excuse the pun, out of this world dream was my mom. Up until this point, my peers, my family, my teachers, and everyone else in my life had listened to me talk about my intentions for space travel with amusement and good-natured patience, thinking, surely, these are the daydreams of a child and something that I would eventually grow out of once I realized just how impossible they were. 
My mom was the first person to actually believe in me, but she didn't just give her trust to me blindly. She sat down with me and bluntly told me the truth about my dream. She told me the statistics, described to me just how difficult this path would be, and admonished that if I was going to follow it, I needed to make a plan now. I consider, I consider this hard conversation at 11 years old to be really one of the foundational elements that has allowed me to hold on to my dream for so long and to continue chasing after the near impossible. Facing the potential for failure at such an early stage in my career has allowed me to sit comfortably with failure and see it not as an end to a dream, but rather as a means to achievement. But sitting with failure is a lot easier said than done. No one likes to fail, it's uncomfortable. Yet I'm going to tell you that failure is absolutely one of the most important ingredients for success. And I learned this early when I was sitting comfortably with this failure because the odds are inevitably stacked against me becoming one of the 0.000008%. Yeah, that's five zeros after the decimal there. So five zeros, 8% of humanity to actually reach the stars. In many ways, this knowledge of just how unlikely it is, it, it is for me to actually achieve this dream has really been a driving factor in my journey that has allowed me to push forwards and to continue to try to do the impossible. And as I've grown up, it's been my plan for the future, my community, and the confidence that these things have built in me over time that have allowed me to fall down and get back up each and every time, learning from these falls and failures and becoming more confident and capable, not in spite of them, but actually because of them. As women in STEM, the pressure to do things perfect can be massive. Yet we have to fail to do big things. And in order to dream big, we really have to allow ourselves not just to fail, but to have the grace and the kindness to fail frequently and often. So my advice to all women who want to dream big is threefold. Don't be afraid to fall down a lot. Falling down is the point. The more you fail, the more that you will succeed. And I know that it sounds counterintuitive, but I promise that this is true. My second piece of advice is to look for risk and then jump in. It's about trying new things and allowing yourself to fail, to experience, and to grow. Do this often enough and risk won't seem so hard anymore. Believe me, the first time that I jumped out of an airplane, I was afraid. I was petrified. But then before I knew it, it became just another skill that's in my repertoire. And my third piece of advice is to build a strong safety net to catch you. Setting yourself up for both failure and success is essential, and you can do this by building support. In my case, my support network includes my mom, of course, but it also includes mentors, friends, colleagues, and now an entire movement online through the Mars generation, all of who are there to catch me as I test the waters. My advice in building a safety net is to also be a safety net for others whenever you are able to. The more that you lift others up, the more that you will also be supported. Community really is everything. These are the three things that I live by and advise you to live by as well. When I was young, I dared to dream big because I didn't know any better. I didn't know that fewer than 600 people had gone to space. I didn't know that fewer than 50 of them had been women. And at the time when I set my heart on Mars, I didn't even know how impossible that goal seemed. But later on, as I got older and learned more about the realities of technology and space exploration in the 21st century, I continued to dare to dream big. I've chased after my dream of space flight for the love of exploration and because I truly believe that there is no such thing as impossible. Rather, every impossibility is simply a not yet. To chase after your own bold dreams and your not yets, I encourage you to find your community of advocates and supporters, to sit comfortably with failure and view it as a valued experience, and the most important, to never stop dreaming big and don't lose your childhood curiosity. Thank you so much for sharing this with us, Abby. 
I am hearing that we have gotten tons of questions to you, over a hundred questions, so I'm afraid we won't have time for all <laughs> of them. Uh, but the first one out here is, uh, as a woman, what has your biggest challenge been getting you to where you are today? I think one of my biggest challenges uh, so far on my path, uh, specifically as a woman, has been exceeding expectations that are set before me and um, having and finding both the strength within myself and within my community to be able to stand up against um, some of the things that society expects of you. So for example, one of the instances where I started to learn and realize how important it is for women in STEM to have both this internal drive and to surround themselves with people who support them uh, externally was when I first started to study to become a pilot. And the first uh, pilot instructor that I flew with asked me why I wanted to become a pilot. And I told him my story of wanting to be an astronaut and hopefully the first astronaut on Mars and said how becoming a pilot was an important step towards this dream and this goal. And without even missing a beat, he looked at me and said, oh, you shouldn't bother to, to get your pilot's license because in 15 or 20 years, you'll have kids and you won't want to go to space anymore. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> and it just, it kind of blew my mind because that was the first, uh, the first really flagrant example that I had experienced of being dismissed, not on the basis of my merits or my capabilities, but merely because of my gender and the expectations for my gender within society. And so that was really a difficulty and a challenge to, to face that and, um, to learn that so much of the world really does still view women in that way. And it, it made it even more important to me to search out the people who, you know, both men and women who are acting as support and who are excited about the next generation of women in STEM who are coming up. Um, just to end the story on a good note, though, I'm now officially a licensed pilot. So yes. uh, <laughs> obviously that didn't hold me back. That's good. That's lovely to hear. Uh, so, so how close are you actually to, to go to space? It's, it's a common question. Um, and the answer is that I am still uh, probably about five to 10 years out. I would say more likely in the range of 10 years. Um, becoming an astronaut really is a long journey and it's a long path. I've already been working towards it for a couple of decades now and I have about another decade ahead of me. The most important thing that I am um, working on and will need to do before I begin applying to the astronaut corps is uh, education which is hands down 100% the most important feature in an astronaut's resume is their ed education and research experience. And so currently I'm working as a research scientist at Harvard Medical School in immunology and molecular biology. And I'm in the process of applying to graduate school. And then so um, once I have my uh, advanced graduate degree, that's when I will begin applying to the NASA astronaut program. Mm. Um a third question here then, uh, your best tip to young girls wanting to follow in your footsteps, what would that be? My best tip to young girls wanting to follow in my footsteps would definitely be to search out help and to search out mentorship and role models. And sometimes that can be in the form of a direct connection that you might have. I was really lucky when I was a teenager that I met an astronaut by complete happenstance in an airport actually, who ended up uh, being my, my mentor over the years. And I was able to ask him questions and really get a lot of insight into what I needed to do in order to achieve my dreams in the future. But I was also able to look up to him and see myself in his shoes and know that someone who had already achieved this big, crazy dream of mine believed that I could also do it. And that was a really helpful thing, especially as I was going through having to, you know, um, pick schools and uh, choose degree paths and all of that. It was just really helpful to know um, both that I had someone in my corner and to be able to envision my future. And so whether the role models and mentors that, uh, that girls are finding are personal connections like that or someone that they look up to, um, I think 
both both sides and fields of that are important to have uh, the ability to really envision yourself in their position in the future. Mm, absolutely. Um, do you have any fears? <laughs> yeah, definitely. What are those? Um, so let's see. I think that, uh, well, like I said in my speech, one of the things that I've done to add to my resume as a um, to, to someday become an astronaut is uh, skydiving and parachuting. And that was definitely a fearful event for me the first couple of times that I did it, uh, um, as was flying, to be honest. When I was younger, I had a fear of heights, which is really ironic, isn't yeah. it? <laughs> <laughs> for someone who wants to become an astronaut, that was a really unfortunate fear to have. And I was really lucky that because I had discovered this dream of mine so early and really set my mind to it, I had a lot of time to manage and deal with that fear. And now heights are one of my favorite things ever. I love oh, wow. to fly. I love to jump out of airplanes, at, not at the same time. Um, I, love to, <laughs> I love to do all of these things. And it was really because I was able to address that fear, give it space to to exist within me without holding me back from the enjoyment of activities that live side by side with that fear. Who is your uh, most influential role model? I would say that my most influential role model is um, astronaut Luca Parmitano, who is with the European Space Agency. He's an Italian astronaut. And um, this is the astronaut that I mentioned earlier who I randomly happened across in an airport when I was 13 years old. And uh, he really is a role model to me, both because of the help and inspiration that he's given me personally, but also because of his incredible dedication to inspiring and supporting the next generation of explorers and um, people in STEM fields. And that really has helped me to, to shape my interests and passions, not just for my personal goal of becoming an astronaut and going to Mars, but also for my my other goal and passion, which is um, advocating for women and underrepresented peoples in STEM fields. Uh, and so I definitely look up to astronaut Luca as a, a role model, both in the space industry and um, in the STEM education fields. Mm. Yeah, it is so beautiful to see you looking up to Luca and now all of these other uh, young people out there looking up to you the same way that you are with him. It's, it's lovely to see. Uh, Thank you. We have another question. Do you believe in aliens? <laughs> <laughs> This is, this is one of my favorite questions, actually. Um, so my research experience before I came to Harvard and uh, started to get involved in immunology, my previous research experience was in astrobiology, so the study of life in space. And um, with that said, uh, I do fully believe in aliens. I, <laughs> I think that it is inevitable that life exists somewhere out there hopefully within our solar system, but if not within our solar system, within one of the countless other systems that exist within the universe. Mm. Uh, the caveat that I always like to put on when we talk about um, extraterrestrial or alien life, though, is that the reality is that the first instances and engagements that we have with aliens won't likely be with, I mean, I'll never say never because anything's possible, but it's very unlikely that we will run into what you would think of as the classic alien, mm. you know, two feet tall, green skin, <laughs> four arms, eight eyeballs, all of that. The, the truth of the matter from an astrobiological standpoint is that if life exists within our solar system, it is most likely single cellular life. So more similar to a bacteria or a virus um, rather than being these complex life forms that we often think of. Got it, got it. Um, so we have time for one final question. Uh, were you ever close to giving up? Was I ever close to giving up? That, that's a, it's a good question. Um, I think I haven't ever lost my drive or my passion for my dream. There have definitely been moments and instances when I have... Um, felt, 
I guess you could say concerned or scared about how large of a dream it was uh, or is and how much um, time stretches forward before me. But I've always looked at it with the the feeling and the life philosophy that I might as well try. And one of the things that really drives me to continue to reach towards this dream, even when I'm having instances of self-doubt, is the knowledge that um, trying and failing is better than having not tried at all. And that really is a, a, a method that I live my life and my dream by, is looking at everything that I do and making sure that it doesn't just build towards becoming an astronaut. Um, I would hate to get to the end of my life and have not achieved this dream and look back and feel like everything else I'd done was useless. So instead, I try to have everything be a dual purpose. I try to have it work as a building block towards achieving my dream of spaceflight and be fulfilling and meaningful um, for its own purpose as well. So for example, becoming a pilot was definitely a step that I took because I want to be an astronaut. Hmm. but it was also something that I did because I love to fly and I love to explore and I love um, those those feelings of freedom and everything and so I really look at it with the hope that when I look back I will be able to say that I've lived a worthwhile and exciting life regardless of where I finally end up. Hmm. Hmm. Thank you so much for, for being here with us, uh, sharing this with us, Abby, and best of luck to you on your uh, future journey, and uh, bye for now. Thank you so much for having me, and thank you to all the fantastic questions as well. Um, I know that you said there were over 100 questions, and of course we haven't had a chance to answer all of them, uh, but I would like to invite everyone who's watching to uh, find me and feel free to ask questions on social media. My handles are Astronaut Abby. Um, and then to also take a look and check out my nonprofit, The Mars Generation. There's a lot of great resources for anyone interested in STEM or really dreaming big at all. Great. Thank you so much. Uh, so let's learn from Abby. Let's never stop chasing our dreams. Let's not stop thinking about them, talking about them, but continue sharing this on other platforms. For example, Volvo Group's channels or Astronaut Abbey. Um, now I would like to see what you are up to, Celine. So I'm handing it over to you. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Anna. Uh, you know, I'm reflecting something that Eureka and Abby both mentioned. Uh, that is actually stopping ourselves uh, to reach for our own stars. It's stereotypes or unconscious biases. You know, those beliefs or thoughts we hold about uh, other people or about ourselves that actually uh, limit our potential. Uh, you know, things... Uh, we imagine that things should be one way or another. Uh, now, I would like to introduce you to our next speaker, that's Hope Rush. He's a talent director at Volvo Group, and she will show us how to identify our own unconscious biases and smash them, or at least smash the negative ones. Uh, Hope is with us in uh, Greensboro, uh, North Carolina. Over to you, Hope. Hello, everyone. Before we jump into our topic, I want to take just a moment to get us all on the same page with a simple exercise. Close your eyes, take a deep cleansing breath, and allow me to guide you through a day in the life. It's pouring rain as a candidate rushes through the door of a major tech company to interview for a senior technical engineering role. As soon as they walk through the door, they are greeted by the receptionist who offers them a beverage and escorts them to the conference room to prepare for the interview. Along the way, they can't help but notice a lovely family portrait on the desk of an employee, which makes them smile. To top it off, as they are waiting for the interview to begin, the company CEO approaches the interview room, sticks their head in to say hello, and wishes them luck. The candidate thinks, wow, could this get any better? Now open your eyes and let's reflect on what you visualized. Was the interview candidate a woman? Was the receptionist a man? Was the beverage a lemonade? Did you envision the family portrait being an LGBTQ couple with their kids? 
Did the CEO look like me? This exercise conveys how biases reveal themselves daily in our decision making. Your initial choices were determined based on your past experiences, which influenced your response, which may have resulted in an incorrect assumption. Biases are a normal part of our daily lives. Acknowledging that biases exist or that someone has biases doesn't automatically equal being racist, sexist, chauvinistic, or any other label we tend to use because biases aren't always bad. The word bias itself typically scares people, but actually it shouldn't. As a woman, and specifically in male dominated tech fields, it's very likely that you have been subjected to bias and you may even have biases of your own against yourself and other colleagues, including other women. Who has ever experienced a male colleague explaining technical terms to a woman in a way that she can understand? A teacher that discouraged you from following tech studies? Or you for not applying for that dream job because you didn't meet every qualification? All of these are examples of how bias shows up in the workplace and in society every day. Our biases are influenced by family, cultural norms, personal values and beliefs, and even the media all play key roles in how our biases are formed. Our mental processes allow us to receive, store, and filter data that helps us make decisions. The biases are the result of the shortcuts that are taken when our brain eliminates information that it doesn't deem useful. Let's think about computer algorithms. If you go online and select similar topics over and over, the computer then starts to push information to you that matches your previous searches. Have you ever mentioned a product in a conversation and when you pick up your phone, that item just magically pops up on your social media page? Bias works pretty much the same way. When you need to make a decision, your brain automatically pushes information to you that it thinks is relevant and valuable. It's up to you to force yourself to think differently. Some of our thoughts can seem small and innocent, but when spoken aloud, they may not be received the same way. So how do we manage our biases? It starts with an increased level of self-awareness because although our biases can be managed, they can never be eliminated. Secondly, ask for feedback because others typically see things about us that we don't see for ourselves. Then ask yourself some critical questions. Why did I think that way? Was my perception true? What influenced my thoughts? We must challenge ourselves to look for information that directly contradicts our assumptions and snap judgments. Think back to our story. Given the information you have now, would the characters you chose be different? If so, that's an example of how we need to challenge our thinking to address and mitigate our biases. So the next time you catch yourself in a biased thought, don't see it as a failure because giving yourself permission to identify your biased thoughts is a huge success. It means that you are becoming more aware, that you are learning, and that you are challenging your thinking. It takes boldness, courageousness, and thoughtfulness for us to leverage our strengths and serve as allies for each other. It can be uncomfortable at times, but by continuously challenging your own thoughts, you can change the world. Our thoughts shape our actions, our actions shape the world, and together we are shaping the world we want to live in. Wise words, as usual, Hope. Uh, many thanks for sharing that knowledge with us. We now would like for you to reflect upon your own biases, the ones that you have towards yourself or towards other women. Now, going forward, knowing this, what will you do differently to try to minimize the more negative biases that we all have? Let's take a, a little while to reflect upon this and get back to the discussion shortly.
let us continue the discussion on unconscious biases, but also loving failure, feeling like a fraud, and all those fascinating questions that you told us were close to your heart. To address those topics, I'm delighted to be surrounded by four very inspiring role models uh, from the Volvo Group. Spotify, we have Aurora Online and Microsoft. I will introduce you in a second, ladies. We're going to spend 25 minutes together and I want this to be interactive so you know the drill. Uh, use the code and post your questions as the presentation unfolds and we will take them in a short while. So you are all working in uh, world-renowned companies. You are being quite successful at what you do. And you know, some of us starting our career or still in our studies, uh, we might have this idea that we need to have it all planned out if we are to be successful. And yet we might not have a clue, right? Um, Gabriela, you have succeeded in data science at Spotify. Uh, you studied industrial engineering at Lund University in Sweden. Did you have a career plan? Um, no, not really. Um, it's more been a series of coincidences that cascaded down to where I am now. I remember in my first year or third year of university, I met this uh, startup guy at a startup fair, which was, I didn't expect much of it at all, but it ended up um, providing me with a, an internship in machine learning. And I think that experience was something that later led to Spotify thinking of me as an interesting candidate. So. It, yeah, it was a, an experience I was really thankful for, but I didn't expect much of it. Uh, but you knew how to take your chances. Yeah. And it paid off. It did. Uh, Nazanin, welcome. You are the IT sales director at uh, Microsoft, and previously you worked in, in sales as well for Dell Technologies. Uh, you have studied at Stockholm University and the Business School of London. Uh, you, you give talks about diversity and inclusion from a gender perspective and also from uh, ethnical, uh, cultural background. And I know you're very uh, passionate about modern leadership. Mm. How did it all start for you? Just like Gabriella, really, it, it was not a clear career path. I was studying for business and uh, I was doing a lot of activities. And one of the activities, I met the recruiter from Dell Technologies. And I had two options. I, I had an option to actually start for a local bank and going the finance route or uh, starting at sales from a global tech company and I'm really glad that I chose the global tech company because I was super inspired by the hiring manager mm -hmm. and since then I've really built my built my career uh, in tech and and really allowing me to follow my passions Let's go over to California, where we have mm -hmm. Nastasha. Uh, thank you very much for being live with us. I know it's a very early start for you. Nastasha, you are the head of UX design at Aurora. Uh, that is uh, a leader in self-driving vehicles. And before that, uh, you worked for IDEO, Uber Advanced Technologies Group, and Samsung. You studied design and neuroscience. Uh, did you know what you wanted to do when growing up, Nastasha? Definitely not. My career has been a constant journey of self-discovery and, you know, I've explored a range of careers from being a journalist to a neuroscientist to a behavioral researcher even before officially pursuing design as a career. Um, the one thing that really inspired me to become a designer is the first web application that I designed that helped people with Alzheimer's recall their past memories that they wouldn't have been able to otherwise without the application's guidance. So this was, if you will, my aha moment um, in my career when I was inspired by Design's Toolkit and its offering to really be able to solve real problems for, for people and shape new experiences for them. Mm. Great story. Uh, last but not least, uh, Karen, you are um, head uh, for strategy and innovation in the operations part of Volvo Group. Uh, you're working from, uh, well, Gothenburg in Sweden, but you were born and raised in San Francisco like Nastasha. And before the Volvo Group, you worked as innovation partnership leader for a company called Humana in uh, San Francisco. Before that, you were a strategic initiatives manager at Kaiser Permanent in Auckland and before that you held multiple assignments in technology for the advisory board company in Washington DC. You have a Master of Science from uh, University of California in San Francisco. Whew, 
across all these many different experiences, did you always have like a clear objective? You can tell I like change. Um, <laughs> Absolutely not. I did not know what I wanted to do. I tried to plan like many people do. And in university, I tried different things and I picked a path, but things did not go as planned. A financial crisis hit during those times. So I had to pivot and start all over again. And this is how I accidentally came into and completely fell in love with technology. And I haven't left since. Mm. I, I like your story because it might actually talk to some of us um, who had uh, everything planned and then the pandemic hit. And now we have to kind of adjust to our environment. Um, I like also to hear that there's not only one way uh, to reach for your own stars. You're all professional uh, in a, a very tech savvy environment that are male dominated. Uh, how are you coping with being a minority? Can I, can I start with you, Nastasha? Yeah, for sure. Um, as a designer, it's really natural for me to have a mindset that any challenge or problem is an opportunity. So while I'm often the only person who looks like me in a room full of men in the majority of my work meetings, I definitely feel united with the other young women in the world who are also changing the trajectory of what a common meeting room of people looks like by being one of the first women in the room. Um, I've been in an industry for about 15 years. So I've sort of had to build a resilience and confidence that comes from a lot of time I've dedicated to my own personal development and being in tune with my own strengths and, you know, my growth opportunities without this kind of introspection and personal development, it'd be really easy to want to blend in rather than stand out. Um, if I can confidently stand out, I hope it encourages others from a diverse background to join in. Karen, do you like standing out? To be completely honest, it can be uncomfortable being a minority, whether you're the only woman in the room or the youngest person in the room or maybe the only person of color in some of our cases. It, it is uncomfortable, but you realize very, very quickly that it can be a, a pro, especially if you see being different as something unique rather than something that can bring you down. The challenge is that people might have assumptions about you. So I remember when I was younger, in my 20s, now I'm in my 30s, I don't get this as much, a lot of people assumed I was the intern or the student and you don't take it personally but it will happen and it might be uncomfortable. Mm. Nazanin, uh, can you recall a situation where you were really made to feel you were a minority? Yeah, sure. So, so there is a lot of situations but one in particular I remember, I think I was um, around my 28 year old and, and I was, it was, was my first time joining the leadership group at my previous work and I was super excited and the first day one of the more senior white men in the leadership group came to me and said, hey Nasanin, now you're part of the senior leadership group. You need to change how you behave, you need to walk slower and basically change the full energy of who I am. Uh, I was young, so I listened to him and, and I started to do exactly that for a week. And after a week, I was standing at the coffee machine and one of my team members came and said, Nasanin, what's wrong with you? What's happened? And from that day on, I decided I really need to embrace the core of myself and be really true to myself. And so, of course, now you, you walk normally. With energy. Gabriela, <laughs> uh, you represent the Z generation. Do you relate to these stories? Mm, not completely, actually. It's very rare in my day-to-day -day work that I'm the only woman in the room. Um, most of my colleagues and my closest team are women and also many of my senior stakeholders. But I think that probably depends a lot with what industry you're in and what team. Um, I guess Spotify doesn't have as much of that legacy culture since it's a younger younger company. Yeah, for sure. Well, it's actually reassuring to hear that things are evolving. Yeah. Um, I I'm wondering, can being a minority be actually a positive thing? What do you think, Nazanin? Well, if I look at my full career, I mean, it has been a positive thing and it's one reason and a major reason why I'm here and I have a successful career. But, but if I could give you one example, I remember when I was around 26 year old, uh, uh, I was holding an account as a sales representative and it was a global account and together with the Swedish delegation, we were going to meet the CIO in New York. So we come there and the Swedish delegation go and, and meet their colleagues and I uh, directly going to the, to the conference room where the CIO was. And the first thing that happens when I enter the door is that he says, stop, 
you're in the wrong room. And as Karen said, he probably thought I was an intern or an assistant. Uh, but I had two choices there, right? So either I go out and come back with the Swedish delegate, or I go in and be bold. And I, of course, decided to go in and be bold. So I just walked past that big conference room table, walked to the end, sat next to him and said, no, I'm actually at the wrong, in the wrong room. You are, the, you are the one, me is the one that you're going to meet today. And it was tough for the first hour, but when he saw the capabilities that I came with, and actually knowing his uh, company more than him, it was actually, I put a mark on him and it became an advantage. Mm -hmm. So really trust in your capabilities and use this as an advantage. Mm. Have you used being a minority to your advantage as well, uh, Karen? Reflecting upon the career and everything, I think it can be a great advantage because initially you walk into the room or go somewhere or join a team and you're already different. So I think you can kind of be yourself and not conform to the status quo. And if I reflect even further, maybe it had something to do with me even working with innovation and strategy because you need to think different and be different. Mm -hmm. So uh, maybe it has been a really good experience to create who I am today. Nastasha, what do you say? Is it a boon or bane to be a woman in tech? Yeah, I, I think it's something that I embrace. Um, the most important principle I hold close is to not see my differences being young, female, and Asian as a disability, but really rather as a unique value proposition and opportunity to contribute a different perspective to that mm -hmm. company. Um, when you're building a self-driving car product, um, in the case of myself and my team at Aurora, it's really important to us uh, to make it accessible to all. Otherwise, we're not successful. Um, and in order to create a universal product, you really have to understand the perspectives that come from every spectrum of diversity. Mm -hmm. So I think it's really fundamental that we continue to improve that um, and we're able to then create products and services that solve problems for all people, not just a small segment of. It makes sense, of course. Um, so let's just enjoy the journey, right? But th the future is unknown. It can be scary at times. Uh, are we not afraid to take risk? I mean, Gabriela. I mean, yeah, but I think it's, it's important to uh, remember that decisions don't have to be permanent. You can decide to try something out and if that doesn't work out, you can change your mind and you have one more experience and you know more about who you are. Um, so in my experience, like relying on your curiosity and intuition, it can't really go too wrong. Nazanin, do you enjoy taking risks as well? Yeah, I feel that every move I've done within my career has been a risk since mm -hmm. I haven't really filled all the boxes every time I've applied for a job. But if I can generalize, most women that look at a position, uh, they say, well, I have six out of 10 uh, boxes here. I still don't have the four last ones, so I won't even apply for that job. But if I generalize and look at the men, they probably feel, oh my God, I already tick six out of 10 boxes, so let's apply. And, and this is the core of the mentality that we need to change. And it's even more important if we want to keep women the higher up in the hierarchy we come. And so I really embrace taking risks, be bold, take considered risk, and also get comfortable being uncomfortable. Mm. Uh, Nastasha, can you recall a situation where you took a big risk? Yes, um, my first opportunity to step into the role of a main design lead for a really big client at a place I was working at um, and manage multiple design work streams for a one-year program. Um, it was the first time leading um, a project of the scale, um, so I definitely felt unqualified and unprepared, um, though you know, I stepped into the challenge because I felt like it was the best way to prepare um, for the first time situation by having a strong support system. I had mentors um, and I had seasoned leaders who were helping me um, to be my guide um, and giving me enough confidence to venture into the unknown. Um, taking this risk, um, similar to what Noslin said, like it's really important because it's really paved a path um, for me in my design career. Um, and I was continuing to motivate myself um, to practice design leadership from this point on. Mm. Obviously, uh I see a clear link with innovation. Uh, Karen, are you a risk taker? 
I think I learned to be a risk taker because things have not gone as planned. So naturally, I had to become comfortable with it and em embrace it in a way. Mm. Uh, when I moved to Sweden to live and work, I think that was a really big risk in a new culture, in a new environment, a totally different leadership style. And you don't always have all the training and preparation that you think you uh, should have. Um, but for me, I think it's super important as well to change industries, for example. I changed from healthcare to automotive now, and that was another big change during the move. I really reflect that every few years it's good to change up your job or your environment because you challenge yourself and you push yourself and that's how you grow. Yeah, okay, but I mean, uh, what if things don't work out? I mean, what if you fail? You need to be prepared to fail because you will fail. Hopefully at some point you will fail because that's when you learn. There's these daily micro failures like showing up to a meeting unprepared or speaking up and maybe saying the wrong things or not being heard. Those are normal things you can improve upon every day. But I'm talking about the big failures, the big falls. And those are the ones that in retrospect, I am super proud of because I learned, I came out of it and I'm a transformed person. So I think the bigger, the better. Hmm. Now, Sasha, can you relate to that? Totally, yeah, to build on Karen's answer, you know, the craft of design, um, and I think innovation shares this too, is built on the principle prototype early and often and, and really fail fast. Um, the only way you get to great solutions is by making failed pro prototypes along the way that give you invaluable insights into how to make it better the next time. Mm. So it's my belief that life is a prototype and you have to explore what you're capable of through new opportunities and learn more and more about yourself. Um, I didn't know that I was capable of being a great manager or leader until I had my first experience leading. Um, and that feeling is what really carries me um, in my career um, to really continue to unlock new capabilities I didn't know that I had. Changing topics entirely, feeling like a fraud. Uh, it happens to all of us, of all genders, I think, at times. Can you relate to that, Gabriela? Yeah, totally. Um, I think the first six months of working at Spotify, I kept thinking, like, what am I doing here? When are they going to realize they made a mistake? Um, I was surrounded by so many intelligent and accomplished people that it makes you think, what you yourself is doing there. But eventually, I think, seeing over time that you are actually contributing and also having supportive colleagues and managers that give you feedback and, and know, let you know when you're doing the right thing, I think that helped a lot. Mm. And also just realizing that a lot of the time people don't know what they're doing mm. and they don't know why it's working. <laughs> so you're not alone. Uh, thank you for being honest, Gabriela. I think we can... We all have, you know, a personal story a bit like yours. Um, you look confident and fulfilled. Uh, is it always an easy ride, Nazanin? No, even though my career has been successful over time, it's not been an easy ride. Uh, I can give you an, a, a recent example when I was uh, pregnant mm -hmm. and I was really afraid of, of building my own family because I was thinking that it would hurt my career. Uh, but when I did and became pregnant, I was really feeling sick for several weeks. But still, every day I went to the office because I felt that I had to prove myself. And, but I had already proven myself for several years. So again, we need to really trust in our capabilities. And when I had the chance to actually take over one year maternity leave, that's where I really changed mindset and, and said, I can really do this. If I'm good now, I'll be good later. Mm. Of course, it does make sense when you see it from a distance. Mm. Um, Nastasha, do you have a secret to keep going when self-doubt sneaks in? Yeah, I would say reach out to, you know, your dearest mentors and friends who are in your circle of trust and, and ask them to hold up a mirror. Um, it's really easy for your insecurities to surface at times when self-doubt happens. And so I found that mentors in my career who have been really able to see me at my best and my worst can provide a really outside of my head um, perspective um, that is often more fair than I am to myself. Um, also, I would say a personal exercise I also do is reflect on my past accomplishments and learnings um, because they act as proof points for my ability to achieve more and more difficult challenges in the future. It really does remove the ambiguity for me that exists in the moment of self-doubt and helps me focus on a mindset that, you know, I can do this. Mm. Um, you hinted it, uh, uh, you have a, a, a child, you have a family, Nazanin. Family and career, can we have it all? 
Well, first of all, would you have asked that question if we were a, f a panel full of men? Mm. And isn't the question by itself quite biased, right? And, and I really feel uh, really hard on this question because before I uh, started to build my own family, as I said, I was super afraid of being, uh, can we have both? Um, but when I took that maternity leave and got some perspectives and mentorship that we, as we're talking about today, um, I decided, why shouldn't I have both? Uh, why can't we have both? So I turned around the question and, and really started to ask companies that I was in the process with, like Microsoft, what can you do for me to create a great life balance as a leader in your organization. So asking that questions really turns the key on having a young woman building a family as an asset. And hey, it worked. Well done to you. Uh, Gabriela, what's your take on this question? Family and career, can we have it all? Um, I mean, my sense is, and I might be optimistic, but I think it might be a trade-off that belongs more and more to the past. Um, I mean, in Sweden, at least, we, we have really generous parental leave rights, uh, both for men and women. Mm -hmm. And I see a lot of people around me juggling both career and family and really making it work and being inspiring, both um, at my employer, but also friends and people I follow on social media. So, yeah, I think it's slowly changing. Mm. It's very good to hear. Uh, you might be right, Nazanin, my question was a little <laughs> bit biased. <laughs> and uh, Hope uh, talked to us uh, through unconscious biases. Challenging our own biases will create more space for women. Is there anything else that we can do uh, to create more space for, for women in tech? What do you say, Gabriela? Yeah, I think employers can't rely on just the will to hire more women and think that that will be enough unless they actually do changes to the culture and the environment. Mm. So more employers need to actively work with, you know, inclusion and, and creating a safe environment for women. Um, I remember when I first started at Spotify and came into the office, I saw these little utility boxes in the bathrooms with uh, sanitary products and things like that. And it may be or seem like a small thing, but it really signaled to me that women have a place there and that we're not forgotten. Of course. I mean, those small things, do they matter to you, Karen? I think those small gestures make a huge difference in the workplace for women. Mm -hmm. I also very much believe it's how each and every one of us behave. So do we honor and respect maternity leave? Do we talk about our times of the month maybe and when we're a bit down? I mean, these are still topics that are a bit hidden and we shy away from, mm -hmm. but they are part of being a woman. And I think when every individual starts to feel understood and respected, whether it's because they're female or come from a different country or personality traits, you know, how do we work best? Um, that's when we really have an inclusive environment, a respect for every individual. Talking about inclusion and diversity, I know you uh, talk a lot about those topics, Nadalin. And um, my last question to you is, um, you have experienced it firsthand as a manager, right? Tell us the story. Yeah, so I have been driven a lot of activities around inclusion and diversity, um, but uh, the often feedback that I get when wanting to get budget for it or focus on it or even having it on the leadership meetings, it was how can we connect it to the results? And often from men, right? So then I felt, ha, now I'm going to show that this can be connected to the results. And I got the chance to actually build up a totally new department, hire 23 new people, including a sales manager and sales coach, and a full new sales team. And I said, OK, so let's try it. Let's do this team be 50% women, 50% men, mm -hmm. also including different cultural ethnical perspectives and also different experiences from what you have studied or even people who have not studied at all to see can diversity help with the numbers. And it took more time than if we have would just gone and hired all the men. <laughs> Right. So instead of taking three months, it took eight months. Okay. Um, but after already a year, we were the fastest growing department in the full Western Europe. And this just shows that this group created so much innovation that it directly directly could connect to the results. Mm. And 
from that moment on, I say, let's focus on diversity. So that's a real business case. That's fantastic. Thank you, Nazanin, for sharing. I would like to hear uh, from our audience. Anna, did we get many questions? We have gotten so many questions, uh, again, over 100. So I'm afraid that we won't have time to answer exactly all of them. Uh, but starting off then, the tech industry is quite broad. Uh, so do you have any advices on how to find your path? Sure. Um, I think that, again, um, I just started with something. Like you hear Gabriella talking about it. You tried different things with, with Karen as well. And even me, right? Sales was not the path I thought <laughs> when, when starting studying business. So start somewhere. Create that mentorship, join different networks, such as these types of events, to get inspiration of what you want to study. I promise you, either way, which field you go into, it's going to be successful if you are in tech. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, you've talked a bit about uh, your own uh, ways of influencing diversity and, and gender equality and so on. But how can the people that aren't uh, part of that top management, how can we influence top management to really hire more women? I'd love to hear from Nastasha perhaps on that one. Yeah, thanks for asking. Um, you know, I think it's a really important question. I think uh, I always say recruiting is a team activity. It really isn't just about the hiring managers or the leaders. Um, and I create a process that allows for every team of every uh, level um, really engage. Um, and I think that people being able to bring folks that they've worked with in the past um, that know, you know, they bring a diverse perspective, come from a diverse background. Um, that's how you build sort of a diverse team over time. It really is a team effort um, rather than an individual effort. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and here is a question from a student, I'm assuming. Um, do you think that a master's degree is necessary for a leading position in tech? Mm -hmm. What do you think, Gabriela? Um, I don't know. I don't think so. I see, especially within data science, people have so different backgrounds. I mean, some people have PhDs, but others have like, yeah, a bachelor's. And I think there's a way f forward for, for most people. Mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. yeah. And you, Nazanin, in your story, you actually recruited people who maybe didn't have that much of fancy education. Yeah, exactly. And some of them are now really <laughs> developing their careers in, in even being a leader. So I don't think you necessarily need to have that education, but you need to have the passion. Mm. And, and with passion, everything else comes with it. Mm. I can add a little perspective on this because I took a break between my bachelor's and then master of science. I think education is a luxury. Um, it's time, it's sometimes money, depending on where you live and work. So I would not rush into any higher education unless you're sure what you want to do. So for me, I graduated first my, with my bachelor's. I had to pivot anyway, unplanned. And then with some experience and then learning a bit, then I focused on, okay, where do I want to get my master's and what? So I think it's okay to take your time and try different things. But I would not rush into education. But education, of course, is always really good if it can complement your interests. Wise advice. Mm -hmm. So no stress then. <laughs> no. Um, how do we get our male colleagues to support the journey for gender equality? Very Almost important one. One million dollar question. Yes. Want to take it? <laughs> yes. <laughs> well, I, I can start. I think we all can talk around this. But this is so important that the diversity question is not just a gender question and something driven only by women. And why I say that is because the people who have power right now are not always the women. So we really need the men to help us to get more influence. So we will not be able to do this by ourselves. We really need them by our corner. So I always encourage to get that sponsorship, for example, for this full day here, I guess you had the sponsorship of your GM and driving this type of changes really need a, a collected effort. Mm. Nastasha, would you like to add something to this question? 
Yeah, you know, I totally agree with what Nazalyn said. Um, for me, what's really helped me in my career has actually been a series of awesome female advocate males um, who really believed in me and had um, really advocated for me to take on new roles or take on new experiences. Um, so I think first and foremost, it really is important for men to feel like they can help influence women to be um, encouraged um, in case we're feeling too shy or unprepared, um, as some of our conversations have um, discussed. Um, and I think the other piece is um, really helping to lead with empathy. Um, there are a lot of really amazing male leaders I've worked with who always understands that um, there's diversity in the room and maybe um, it's easier for folks uh, who come from maybe more homogenous backgrounds to speak up. Um, and so they really encourage um, a diverse discussion um, by really paying attention to who's in the room. So I really hope that empathic male leaders um, come forward and, and really empower um, diversity to, to take fold. So has anyone ever applied for a job and felt that you haven't gotten it because you were a woman? I can say I have felt not uh, when I when I uh, ended my education and I applied for a lot of internship and, and trainee programs. I often didn't even come that far to get an interview. And I, I think it's a lot of things, not only being a woman, actually, but also having my name, Nazanin Nemachai, was also a hinder. So it also comes from a cultural perspective. And, and these are the things we that have the positions that we have and the power that we have that we need to go in and change. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, we've been talking about uh, mentors. Any advice on finding the best mentor? How do you find these great people? Gabriella, yeah. or you, you, you yeah, had I've, I've had mentors in uh, university and actually found them through this female network uh, that some friends of mine started at university. And I don't know if we were like the perfect match for each other. Um, she was in, yeah, slightly different field, mo even more technical and sort of heavy that way. Um, but I think we found a really good, like she was very open to, to understanding what I needed help with and just being supportive in general. And I think that was the most helpful thing. Um, she, she sat through like interview training with me, mm. which can be a bit uncomfortable in the beginning, like doing something like that with your friends, for example, might feel awkward or whatever. So yeah, I think the perfect fit might be hard to find, but if it's like a decent person, I think it will be, it will be good and yeah. helpful. Yeah. Mm. We have time for one last question, Anna. Yes. Um, how do you deal with self-doubt and uh, how to, do you dare to follow your dream? Mm. Self-doubt, you've, you've all experienced it, right? How do you deal with it? When we prefer, uh, prepared, Karen, you told me about your ways to uh, uh, maybe go out and, and protect yourself from what others mm. think you should do. Self Doubt is really, really interesting. I think everyone feels it and it can be generated by others making, you know, comments or advice to you or reflections to you. And sometimes it's constructive criticism and you can get down by that. But sometimes it's generated by ourselves when we criticize ourselves. So I think self-doubt is very common, but I think building resilience is really important. Mental resilience mm -hmm. and, you know, get out there and be physical and be active and be healthy physically and mentally and really create a uh, a good mindset. Mm -hmm. I think that can help protect yourself mm -hmm. because it's very normal to get advice, whether it's solicited or not, and to feel down, especially when you're growing. So uh, nothing wrong with self-doubt. I think it's supernatural to, to feel that sometimes, but there's many ways to build this mental resilience. Mm -hmm. And uh, Nastasha, I think you, you told us uh, when we prepared that when you don't have the belief in yourself, perhaps you can trust what others think of you. Yeah, absolutely. I think that that's, it's a sort of a figurative mirror that your mentors and people who really um, have seen you at your best and at your worst can really help you understand that 
sometimes you're a little bit too hard on yourself. Um, and I found that having those conversations when I'm doubting myself with people um, like that has really helped me understand that sometimes, um, as Karen mentioned, um, my self-doubt comes from a lot of beliefs that I think people have of, of me from, from just a third person perspective. Um, so definitely have a mentor that you can reach out to who can bring you up at the, those times. Thank you, Nastasha. Uh, thank you, Gabriela, Nazanin, Karen. Thank you, Anna. And thank you for all your very many questions. Let's make sure that the conversation continues on social media. Uh, for this very last part of Tech 2021, we would like to take you on a field trip to Elskistuna, that's next to uh, Stockholm in Sweden. And this is where two of our colleagues, uh, Gabriela and um, Gabriela is here. So Johanna and Mariella um, are actually uh, giving birth to vehicles of the future that run on electricity and that drive themselves. Let's go behind the scenes of a pretty cool invention. Thank you so much, Celine, and uh, welcome to Eskilstuna. Let's see what's behind this door. Hello, welcome. Thank you. How are you? I'm fine, thanks. How are you? I'm fine, thank you. Uh, where are we? We are in our office backyard, actually, in our autonomous test track in Eskilstuna. And who are you? Is that a philosophical question now? <laughs> no, uh, but I ask the questions here. Okay, sorry. Uh, repeat, please. Who are you? Name and occupation. My name is Johanna Huggere, and I work as a global technology manager at Volvo Autonomous Solutions. And what is this uh, trailer-like cabin? Is it your gaming crib? This is our bish, as we call it. This is where we operate our autonomous fleet and supervise it, hence the screens. Oh. And how did you get here? I took my electrical car. I mean, how did you get here in your career? Oh, okay, sorry. Uh, I actually started as a summer intern in 2008, and then I did my master's thesis on our hybrid vehicles. After that, I just coded my way into team leading. And today? Today I work as a manager, but before that I was managing electromobility projects. Never looking back? No, I really love my job, but I do miss coding. Ah, so coding is your favorite part of engineering, I guess? Yes. So why do you miss coding? Aren't you coding uh, all day long? Actually, I'm not anymore. Now I work with developing people and building our team strategy and so on. So not so much coding. Working with people. That sounds like lots of meetings, presentations and demos. Yeah, lots and lots. You know, when you work with uh, autonomous technology like this, you're at the forefront of uh, tech. So that means presentations amongst other things. And let's say you have a super important presentation coming up. What do you do? I would prepare so much, but I would also definitely listen to really, really loud music. Right now I have Sara Klang's Ghost Killer on repeat. It's a fantastic song. Oh, I like that. And what's the most nervous you've been before doing a demo presentation? I'm going to show you one of the reasons. I've been most nervous about doing demos with our Tara. For instance, when we were at the electric site in Göteborg, demonstrating in front of customers and media and our senior management. It was super, super, super scary. <laughs> uh -huh. And why? Uh, the special thing with the demo was that, you know, a quarry in itself is like an unreal out of this world landscape. You feel like you're on the moon and then seeing these autonomous machines just driving around, it's uh, such a cool experience. Tara, who's that? I'm going to show you. Come on. This is a very cool place, Johanna, but look here. Why is there a dent on the doorway? Well, big Tara, narrow doorway, combining that with on-the-job training, and there you have it. Okay, but wait, 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 wait. Here's another dent. Oh, you saw that one. Well, sometimes you just don't learn from other people's mistakes. You have to do them yourself. Okay, better not ask about this guy. No, don't, please. Why all these mistakes? We've been working with Tara for so many years and making mistakes is actually a vital part of what we do and why we have so, so much success. Here's one of Tara's other mothers, Marielle Gallardo. Hi. Hey, Marielle. Hi, Anna. High five. Hi. Cool high five. <laughs> and this cool Tara, is it a bird or is it a plane or...? You name it. She can swim and she can fly, but she's amazing in transporting stuff. And she's super smart. Okay, can you show her to us? Ah, yeah, follow me.
Great that you bring your computer, looks professional. So here's her internal organs, you can say. Uh -huh. And if we move to the front, we have her eyes here, so, so, so that she can navigate the world, and then a bucket. Uh -huh. But can you describe yourself a little, Marielle? Yeah, I'm Marielle Gardo, engineer at Volvo Autonomous Solutions. And I work with Taras every day, perfecting her for future assignments and making sure that no door frames are hit. Ah, uh, and no cab. Are you the driver? Uh, she doesn't need one. She's autonomous. And she's a female, right? Yeah. How do you know? Johanna has the answer, I think. I mean, Tara, it means queen or star or diamond, so obviously she's female, right? That makes sense. Who decided the name? You? No, I did not. I didn't either. Uh, we work with development of autonomous software and components, so it's not our job. How do you rate Tara's cool factor on a scale from 1 to 10? 10 out of 10, easily. Yeah, she's the definition of innovative technology. Have you always known that you would work with tech? No. I first studied social science, then I did a computer networking Ooh, nice. course, and that was fun. And then I did a bachelor's in computer networking, and I discovered coding was even more fun, so I applied for a master in embedded systems, but never applied for a bachelor's in programming, because I thought it's going to be too hard. Uh, but you challenged your fears. Yeah, and by doing new things, I discovered my passion, programming. And who's your inspiration? Do you have someone you look up to? Yeah, many. In particular one, and she's standing next to me. <laughs> Marielle, you're embarrassing me, <laughs> but you're also lovely. Best boss ever. Yeah. And why? She's an amazing leader. She's inspired me to do my best at work and to have fun as well. Johanna, then I want to know, what's your secret advice to the audience watching? I would say find what's unique about you and that's probably your strength. So leverage that and make sure that you trust your instinct, even if it's very different from others. What's the biggest mistake you've done creating Tara? You've, you've seen my biggest mistake. It's actually the big dent on the tent. Johanna is still smiling. And what's your next dream job? It's more Tara-like projects. I love working with automation. It's like creating life in a sense. You're creating these intelligent machines that are supposed to navigate the world and make it a safer place. Speaking on uh, creating life, one baby on the way and the Tara baby over here. Who do you love the most? Oh, you can't compare love like that. Okay, I understand. Uh, not in front of the camera at least. Uh, thank you, Marielle. Nice to meet you. Let's thank go find you, Johanna again. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We have 60 seconds left before we must hand over to the studio. Are you ready? Shoot! Favorite innovator? Ada Lovelace. Tech role model? My father. What are you reading at the moment? At work I'm reading Fearless Organization by Amy Edmondson and at home I love Delia Owens where the crawdads sing. How does it feel to leave Tara in the end of the day? Oh, but it's so sad. Favorite coding language? I have to say C, but honestly, it's graphical programming. How did you prepare for this interview? I binge-watched the Gilmore Girls for a full week. Johanna, honestly, I think your job sounds amazing, and I'm kind of tired walking around with this camera. Would you advise me to apply for a job here? I think it's honestly beautiful with a career change, so it's never too late. I really think you should send it, to be honest, because we need diversity in our business as well. I actually have a business card here, so if you take this, Thank you so much. No, thank you, and really good having you. Bye-bye. Say bye to Tara from me. Will do. Hmm. Evolvegroup.com slash career. Well, why not? Over to you, Celine. Now you need, you know what to do right now, right? <laughs> yes, that was very clear. <laughs> so the event is now um, coming to an end and we would once again like to hear from you. So if you could use one word that's summarizing your uh, experiences over the past 90 minutes, we would like to hear that. So use this Menti code and type in that word that represents uh, your experience from Tecker 2021.
If you liked the event, it will be available on volvogroup.com, on LinkedIn, and on YouTube for you to watch again and to share with your network and your friends. Let's make sure as many women as possible around the world uh, get inspired and uh, this chance to reflect. Absolutely. So what are your key takeaways from this event, Celine? Too many. Uh, if I were to pick a few, I would say um, tap into my network, the power of community. That's very important. Uh, challenging my biases, uh, go for my dreams, uh, even they are, if they are big. Uh, learn to love failure because this is going to be a learning journey. And... Um, I think the most important one is never let anyone tell me what or who I should be. Amen to that. Mm? Mm. <laughs> Let's oh, see what we... Ah, inspiring. That's exactly what we wanted, right? Yeah. We wanted to inspire. That's great. Energizing. Interesting. Wow. Awesome. Cool. Enthusiastic. And there's a heart. Uh, it seems that... Uh, You've had a good time with us. Thank you very much for uh, watching. It's time to say goodbye. Um, and I would like to send you off with uh, a tribute to five of the very many Volvo Group women that are role models every day. And they could be actually any one of you. Uh, we hope to see you again soon and uh, take care. Bye for now. So when I was a kid, I think I was uh, four years old, I, I had a dream, I was flying. And when I woke up, I, I wanted to build an airplane. My name is Emmy, Vilma, Marilyn, Kerry, Pratima Dal, and I'm an engineer. I'm the type of person that really needs to be involved in the work that I do. I, I can't come to my workplace and just do my thing and then go home. I really want to feel like I'm a part of something greater. What I love with IT is that you're never done with learning. My father has uh, five children, and I am the only one who shared his interest in building things. Um, he was an engineer, and here I am, also an engineer. I love to analyze the problems and find out the most optimum solution. I love to, to help my team members when they face any technical challenges, and I love coding. It was not easy for me uh, to be in technology. People have seen me differently being a woman, but uh, I dedicated myself into this, and I didn't let it put me down. I'm extremely proud that I'm the third generation on the father's side of my family to work for Volvo. It's my past, my family, and I view it as my future. When I started as an apprentice 13 years ago, I jumped into really deep technical context and I learned. That's what makes you proud of yourself, seeing the evolution from where you started to where you are today. Volvo is a canvas full of opportunities for me. I can paint it the way I want. As an engineer, my work is all about details. And it's very much like my hobby, which I'm very passionate about. I like that it's very flexible. You can make anything, as long as you have fabric and a pattern. When people hear Volvo and building an engine, they think that it's, it's dirty, it's loud, it's mostly men, but it, it's, it's the opposite of that. It's clean and it's, it's quiet and a lot of females. And that's what I want future colleagues to know, especially females. We are many and we are here for you. <laughs> and we want you to come to us because it's not what you think. You start small, you have an objective, you need to show that you can make it. Lifting weight and my work is the same. You need to feel that you can do anything. There is no limits. I 
feel very passionate that diversity is a key success factor for any organization. Bringing people together from different walks of life helps people to view things from different perspectives. What is Volvo to you? Uh, well, Volvo is to me. Development. Mm. Traveling, meeting people. Innovation, growth, and possibilities. 